Section 4 Shock after shock had destroyed his capacity for fear. There was nothing left that could move him, even his own death. He looked quietly, dully, at the muzzle of the gun. With slow determination his mind turned over, and he finally realized that this time there was nothing to fear. "'It's me, Adao,' he whispered. "'You'll be all right now.' "'Ah, it is you.' The voice came softly out of the darkness. The gun barrel wavered and sank. "'Lift me up so I can get at this door. Can't seem to stand too well any more.' Neil reached down, found Costa's shoulders, and slowly dragged him to his feet. His eyes were adjusting to the glare above them now, and he could make out the gleam of reflected light on the metal in Costa's fingers. The U.N. man's other hand was clutched tightly to his waist. The gun had vanished. The metal device wasn't a key, but Costa used it like one. It turned in the lock, and the door swung open under his weight. Neil half carried, half dragged the other man's dead weight through it, dropping him to the floor inside. Before he closed the door, he reached down and felt a great pool of blood outside. There was no time to do a perfect job. The hard footsteps were coming, just a few yards away. His sleeves were sodden with blood as he blotted, then pushed rubble into the stain. He pulled back inside, and the door closed with only the slightest click. "'I don't know how you managed it, but I'm glad you found me,' Costa said. There was weakness as well as silence in his whisper. It was only chance I found you, Neil said bitterly, but criminal stupidity on my part that led you walk into this trap. Don't worry about it. I knew what I was getting into, but I still had to go. Spring the trap to see if it was a trap. You suspected then that Hingley was— Neil couldn't finish the sentence. He knew what he wanted to say, but the idea was too unbearable to put into words. Costa had no such compunction. Yes. Dear Hingsley, graduate of the University and practitioner of societics, a traitor, worse than any of his predecessors, because he knew just what to sell and how to sell it. It's never happened before, but there was always the chance. The weight of responsibility was too much. He gave in. Costa's voice had died away almost to a whisper. Then it was suddenly loud again, no louder than normal speaking volume, but sounding like a shout in the secret basement. Neil, it's all right. Take it easy. Nothing is all right. Don't you realize that? I've been sending my reports back, so the U.N. and your Societics people will know how to straighten this mess out. But Hengly can turn this world upside down, and might even get a shooting war going before they get here. I'm out of it. But I can tell you who to contact. People who help. Hold the K-Factor down." That wouldn't do any good, Neil said quietly. The whole thing is past the patch and polish stage now. Besides, I blew the whole works up. My machines and records. You're—you're you're a fool. For the first time there was pain in Costa's voice. No, I was before, but not any more. As long as I thought it was a normal problem, I was being outguessed at every turn. You must understand the ramifications of societics. To a good operator there is no interrelationship that cannot be uncovered. Hengley would be certain to keep his eyes open for another field check. Our kind of operation is very easy to spot if you know where and how to look. The act of getting information implies contact of some kind. That contact can be detected. He's had our location marked and has been sitting tight, buying time. But our time ran out when you showed them we were ready to fight back. That's why I destroyed our setup and cut our trail. But then we're defenseless. What can we possibly do? Neil knew the answer, but he hesitated to put it into words. It would be final then. He suddenly realized he had forgotten about Costa's wound. I'm sorry, I forgot about your being hurt. What can I do? Nothing, Costa snapped. I put a field dressing on. That'll do. Answer my question. What is there left? What can be done now? I'll have to kill Hingley. That will set things right until the team gets here. But what good will that accomplish? Costa asked, trying to see the other man in the darkness of the cellar. You told me yourself that a war wouldn't be averted by assassination. 
No one individual means that much. Only in a normal situation, Neil replied. You must look at the power struggle between planets as a kind of celestial chess game. It has its own rules. When I talked about individuals earlier, I was talking about pieces on this chessboard. What I'm proposing now is a little more dramatic. I'm going to win the chess game in a slightly more unorthodox way. I'm going to shoot the other chess player. There was silence for a long moment, broken only by the soft sigh of their breathing. Then Costa stirred, and there was the sound of metal clinking slightly on the floor. It's really my job, Costa said, but I'm no good for it. You're right, you'll have to go. But I can help you plan it so you will be able to get to Hingley. You might even stand a better chance than me, because you are so obviously an amateur. Now listen carefully, because we haven't much time. Neil didn't argue. He knew what needed doing, but Costa could tell him how best to go about it. The instructions were easy to memorize, and he put the weapons away as he was told. Once you're clear of this building, you'll have to get cleaned up, Costa said. But that's the only thing you should stop for. Get to Hingley while he is still rattled. Catch him off guard as much as possible. Then, after you finish with him, dig yourself in. Stay hidden at least three days before you try to make any contacts. Things should have quietened down a bit by then. I don't like leaving you here, Neil said. It's the best way, as well as being the only way. I'll be safe enough. I've a nice little puncture in me, but there's enough medication to see me through. If I'm going to hole up, I'll hole up here. I'll be back to take care of you. Costa didn't answer him. There was nothing more to say. They shook hands in the darkness, and Neil crawled away. There was little difficulty in finding the front door of the building, but Neil hesitated before he opened it. Costa had been sure Neil could get away without being noticed, but he didn't feel so sure himself. There certainly would be plenty of police in the streets, even here. Only as he eased the door did he understand why Costa had been so positive about this. Gunfire hammered somewhere behind him. Other guns answered. Costa must have had another gun. He had planned it this way, and the best thing Neil could do was not to think about it and go ahead with the plan. A car whined by in the roadway. As soon as it had passed, Neil slipped out and crossed the empty street to the nearest monosub entrance. Most of the stations had valet machines. It was less than an hour later when he reached Hangley's apartment. Washed, shaved, and with his clothes cleaned, Neil felt a little more sure of himself. No one had stopped him or even noticed him. The lobby had been empty, and the automatic elevator left him off at the right floor when he gave it Hengsley's name. Now, facing the featureless door, he had a sharp knife of fear. It was too easy. He reached out slowly and tried the handle. The door was unlocked. Taking a deep breath, he opened it and stepped inside. It was a large room, but unlit. An open door at the other end had a dim light shining through it. Neil started that way, and pain burst in his head, spinning him down face forward. He never quite lost consciousness, but details were vague in his memory. When full awareness returned, he realized that the lights were on in the room. He was lying on his back, looking up at them. Two men stood next to him, staring down at him from above the perspective columns of their legs. One held a short metal bar that he kept slapping into his open palm. The other man was Hankley. "'Not very friendly for an old classmate,' he said, holding out Neil's gun. "'Now get inside. I want to talk to you.' Neil rolled over painfully and crawled to his feet. His head throbbed with pain, but he tried to ignore it. As he stood up, his hand brushed his ankle. The tiny gun Costa had given him was still in the top of his shoe. Perhaps Hengley wasn't being as smart as he should. "'I can take care of him,' Hengley said to the man with the metal rod. "'He's the only one left now, so you can get some sleep. See you early in the morning, though.' The man nodded agreement and left. Slouched in the chair, Neil looked forward to a certain pleasure in killing Hengsley. Costa was dead, and this man was responsible for his death. 
It wouldn't even be like killing a friend. Hingley was very different from the man he had known. He had put on a lot of weight and affected a thick beard and flowing mustache. There was something jovial and paternal about him, until you looked into his eyes. Neil slumped forward, worn out, letting his fingers fall naturally next to the gun in his shoe. Hingley couldn't see his hand. The desk was in the way. All Neil had to do was draw and fire. "'You can pull out the gun,' Hingley said with a grim smile. "'But don't try to shoot it.' He had his own gun now, aimed directly at Neil. Leaning forward, he watched as Neil carefully pulled out the tiny weapon and threw it across the room. "'That's better,' he said, placing his own gun on the desk where he could reach it easily. "'Now we can talk.' "'There's nothing I have to say to you, Hingley.' Neil leaned back in his chair, exhausted. "'You're a traitor.' Hingley hammered the desk in sudden anger and shouted, don't talk to me of treachery, my little man of peace, creeping up with a gun to kill a friend. Is that peaceful? Where are the ethos of humanity now? You were very fond of them when we were in the university. Neil didn't want to listen to the words. He thought instead of how right Costa had been. He was dead, but this was still his operation. It was going according to plan. Walk right in there, Costa had said. He won't kill you, not at first, at least. He's the loneliest man in the universe, because he has given up one world for another that he hasn't gained yet. There will be no one he can confide in. He'll know you have come to kill him, but he won't be able to resist talking to you first. Particularly if you make it easy for him to defeat you. Not too easy. He must think he is outthinking you. You have a gun for him to take away, but that will be too obvious. This small gun will be hidden as well, and when he finds that too, he should be taken off his guard. Not much, but enough for you to kill him. Don't wait. Do it at the first opportunity. Out of the corner of his eye, Neil could see the radio phone clipped to the front of his jacket. It was slightly tarnished, looking like any one of ten thousand in daily use almost a duplicate of the one Hengsley wore, a universal symbol of the age, like the keys and small change in its pockets. Only Neil's phone was a deadly weapon, product of a research into sudden death that he had never before been aware of. All he had to do was get it near Hengsley. The mechanism had been armed when he put it on. It had a range of two feet. As soon as it was that far from any part of his body, it would be actuated. "'Can I ask you a question, Hingsley?' His words cut loudly through the run of the other man's speech. Hingsley frowned at the interruption, then nodded permission. "'Go ahead,' he said. "'What would you like to know?' "'The obvious. Why did you do it? Change sides, I mean. Give up a positive work for this, this negative corruption. That's how much you know about it!' Hingley was shouting now. Positive, negative, war, peace, those are just words, and it took me years to find out. What could be more positive than making something of my life and of this planet at the same time? It's in my power to do it, and I've done it. Power, perhaps that's the key word, Neil said, suddenly very tired. We have the stars now, but we have carried with us our little personal lusts and emotions. There's nothing wrong with that, I suppose, as long as we keep them personal. It's when we start inflicting them on others the trouble starts. Well, it's over now, at least this time. With a single, easy motion, he unclipped the radio phone and flipped it across the desk towards Hingley. Goodbye, he said. The tiny mechanism clattered onto the desk, and Hingley leaped back, shouting hoarsely. He pulled the gun up and tried to aim at the radio phone and at Neil at the same time. It was too late to do either. There was a brief humming noise from the phone. Neil jerked in his chair. It felt as if a slight electric shock had passed through him. He had felt only a microscopic percentage of the radiation. Hingsley got it all. The actuated feel of the device had scanned his nervous system, measured and tested it precisely then adjusted itself to the exact microfrequency that carried the messages in his efferent nervous system. 
Once the adjustment had been made, the charged condensers had released their full blast of energy on that frequency. The results were horribly dramatic. Every efferent neuron in his system carried the message full power. Every muscle in his body responded with a contraction of full intensity. Neil closed his eyes, covered them, turned away, gasping. It couldn't be watched. An epileptic in a seizure can break the bones in an arm or leg by simultaneous contraction of opposing muscles. When all the opposed muscles of Hangley's body did this, the results were horrible beyond imagining. When Neil recovered a measure of sanity, he was in the street, running. He slowed to a walk and looked around. It was just dawn, and the streets were empty. Ahead was the glowing entrance of a monotube, and he headed for it. The danger was over now, as long as he was careful. Pausing on the top step, he breathed the fresh air of the new morning. There was a sighing below as an early train pulled into the station. The dawn-lit sky was the color of blood. Blood, he said aloud. Then, do we have to keep on killing? Isn't there another way? He started guiltily as his voice echoed in the empty street, but no one had heard him. Quickly, two at a time, he ran down the steps. The End End of Section 4 End of The K-Factor by Harry Harrison Recording by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, April 2012 There above them now, and he could make out the gleam of reflected light on the metal in Costa's fingers. The U.N. man's other hand was clutched tightly to his waist. The gun had vanished. The metal device wasn't a key, but Costa used it like one. It turned in the lock, and the door swung open under his weight. Neil half carried, half— It's me, Adao, he whispered. You'll be all right now. Ah, it is you. The voice came softly out of the darkness. The gun barrel wavered and sank. Lift me up so I can get at this door. Can't seem to stand too well any more. Neil reached down, found Costa's shoulders, and slowly dragged him to his feet. His eyes were adjusting to the gla- Section 4 Shock after shock had destroyed his capacity for fear. There was nothing left that could move him, even his own death. He looked quietly, dully, at the muzzle of the gun. With slow determination his mind turned over, and he finally realized that this time there was nothing to fear. Dragged the other man's dead weight through it, dropping him to the floor inside. Before he closed the door he reached down and felt a great pool of blood outside. There was no time to do a perfect job. The hard footsteps were coming, just a few yards away. His sleeves were sodden with blood as he blotted, then pushed rubble into the stain. He pulled back inside, and the door closed with only the slightest click. "'I don't know how you managed it, but I'm glad you found me,' Costa said. There was weakness as well as silence in his whisper. "'It was only chance I found you,' Neil said bitterly. "'But criminal stupidity on my part that led you walk into this trap. Don't worry.